Well, class, we've made it to the end of our cancer chapter. We're going to talk about P53, a tumor suppressor gene. This is my favorite gene of all the genes we have. This is super important in controlling the growth of cells and limiting the growth of cancers. We see P53 mutated in, in almost half of cancers. So it is playing a very big role that it has to be mutated so much for cancers to be developing. So in typical cells, when there is DNA damage, that is going to trigger P53. And that P53 pathway is going to trigger cell cycle arrest. That gives the cell time to pause the cell cycle. It's not going to keep dividing until it has corrected that DNA damage. Then if the DNA damage is corrected, then the cell can go on doing what it needs to. If the DNA damage cannot be corrected, the P53 pathway triggers apoptosis of that damaged cell. So when P53 is disrupted, you have a failure of apoptosis. That failure of apoptosis means you have cells not dying, you have them growing, and those cells have DNA damage in them. So that is going to lead to cancer development. It allows survival and reproduction of cells that are damaged. Some people are born with an, um, they just inherited a defective copy of P53. And having an inherited P53 gene will exhibit an increased cancer risk in those patients. Cancers almost always exhibit mutations in multiple genes. So just because P53 is is damaged doesn't mean you automatically have cancer. It's usually going to take um, multiple gene damage. Um, but we see that in cancer cells, there are mutation rates that are hundreds or thousands of times higher than normal, or that is called genetic instability. And it makes sense, right? If you don't have a functional P53, you have DNA damage from that. That allows more damage to go unchecked um, and as damage is being picked up, it's not being corrected, so it just keeps piling on. You can have defects in genes needed for mismatch repair, for excision repair. You're not getting repair of your genes through that pathway. Defects in proteins involved in repairing double-stranded breaks. That's when your total chromosome breaks through both strands. It could rejoin to other chromosomes. You could just end up with smaller bits of chromosomes, and you're not correcting it as the cell is continuing to go through the cell cycle. Disruptions in chromosome sorting during mitosis is one way that you can break chromosomes. So maybe they're not appropriately connected to the microtubules are being pulled and broken. Or maybe they're not packaging their DNA correctly into their chromatids, so it's being broken. Cancer cells sometimes have defects in proteins involved in attaching chromosomes to the spindle. The spindle is what pulls those chromosomes apart. So if they're not correctly attached to the, to the spindle, they're not going to be properly separated. So you'll end up with some cells with too many chromosomes and some cells with not enough. Some cells don't have a correctly functioning mitotic assembly checkpoint. So you're not properly doing mitosis the way that it needs to be done. All of those can lead to genetic instability through some defect in mitosis. Tumor suppressor genes can be divided into gatekeeper genes and caretaker genes. Gatekeeper genes are things like RB, P53, APC, that when they are lost, the cell starts proliferating excessively. Caretaker genes are genes that are involved in repairing DNA and sorting chromosomes. They, they maintain genetic stability, so when they're lost, you have unstable genes. Both of them, though, both gatekeeper genes and caretaker genes, are types of tumor suppressor genes. Um, and we're going to have a chance in class to you'll be able to find some recent literature about one of these genes, whatever you find to be your favorite. Um, and we're going to share some current research on some of these topics. Gene expression can also be changed through epigenetic changes. So if you remember, epigenetic changes are things like histone acetylation or DNA methylation, things that affect how a DNA how a gene is able to be turned on and off, but it doesn't actually permanently mutate your DNA. 
Epigenetic changes can be inherited and passed down to children. But they're usually not permanent. Usually after a few rounds of cell, um, a few generations, those epigenetic changes eventually fall off. Um, one thing we see different in cancer cells is that they can have DNA methylation, epigenetic methylation of genes differently than it should be. We can silence genes by methylating their promoters. So by putting this methyl group on their CG sites at their promoters, the genes are silenced. If a cancer cell is able to do this on a tumor suppressor gene, then they have inactivated their tumor suppressor gene. That is going to be an initiatory event to developing cancer. So to sum up this chapter, let's talk about these hallmarks of cancer. Carcinogenesis is all of these steps that were involved in converting a normal cell into a cancer cell. And they may pick up these traits in different ways, but we are going to see these six hallmarks of cancer common to all types of cancer. These are self-sufficiency and growth signals, insensitivity to anti-growth signals, evasion of apoptosis, limitless replicative potential, sustained angiogenesis, and tissue invasion and metastasis. This is kind of a good summary of everything we've talked about in this chapter, but let's review it again. So one is self-sufficiency and growth signals. Normal healthy cells need to have an, um, a growth factor that comes from outside of itself. They are not normally gonna proliferate unless that growth factor from outside of that cell is being provided for, for it. Cancer cells can activate oncogenes and avoid the need for growth factors. One example is a mutant RAS protein that we see in a quarter to a third of human cancers that promotes cell division without growth factors present. Another is insensitivity to anti-growth signals. So normal tissues are going to stop themselves from excess proliferation by having mechanisms in place to inhibit their growth and cancer cells turn off those anti-growth signals. A lot of inhibiting signals are going to come through the RB protein, and mutating the RB gene will make cells insensitive to anti-growth signals and allow those cells to grow. Cancer cells are able to evade apoptosis. Apoptosis normally destroys cells with genetic damage. We saw that in mutations with P53 gene. P53 pathway is normally supposed to trigger cell death in cells that have damaged DNA. When p53 is mutated, cells with damaged DNA are allowed to keep growing. p53 pathway can also be disrupted um, by mutations in other genes, so the MDMD2 gene or the BCL2 gene. Limitless replicator potential we saw by telomere maintenance. So usually as every time a cell divides, its telomeres get shorter. Um, Cancers are able to activate the gene for telomerase, and telomerase will keep that telomere long. So cancer cells keep their telomere length above that threshold and are able to indefinitely divide. And sustained angiogenesis. So cancer cells need a blood supply to be able to grow beyond just tiny little couple of millimeter dots. So they commonly activate genes to in, uh, encode angiogenesis stimulators and inhibit genes that encode angiogenesis inhibitors. Cancer cells are able to invade other tissues and metastasize to faraway places. They do this by decreasing their cell to cell adhesion, things like E. cadherin, by increasing their motility and by producing proteases those proteases are going to degrade the basal lamina and the extracellular matrix that function as a barrier between where the tissue normally should be and where other tissues should be. They're able to invade right into that area. Aggressive cancers are going to have two especially enabling characteristics. One is genetic instability and one is tumor promoting inflammation. So genetic instability lets them pick up those mutations and an increased level of mutation is going to lead to those hallmarks of cancer. Tumor promoting inflammation is going to help the tumor avoid the immune system. So tumors are commonly infiltrated by immune system cells. 
that are probably trying to attack the tumor. But the inflammatory effect is going to enhance tumor growth and lead to the hallmarks of cancer. So some things we see in cancer cells, some features we see. They have large, irregularly shaped nuclei. They have prominent nucleoli. They have very busy ribosomes, so they have very prominent nucleoli. The ratio of their nucleus compared to their cytoplasm is high. Their cells have weird sizes and weird shapes. They aren't going to be the same. They have a lot of variation, but they're not doing the normal thing. And they often lose their normal organization, grow in weird shapes, weird tumor boundaries like you see here. We don't always know how all of these aberrant traits arise originally. Um, probably they involve DNA mutations that occur in the ori original initiating mutation. New traits can arise by changes in the expression of normal genes, and epigenetic mechanisms can alter gen gene activity without permanently mutating that gene. Okay, congrats to making it to the end of our cancer chapter. The next chapter we're going to cover is our cell cycle, how the cell goes through the cell cycle, and how it controls um, the cell cycle to prevent it from going inappropriately. I will see you soon. Bye.